Okay, all right. So we were saying that uh, Paul is right now in the city of Athens. Okay, you uh, notice how in Philippi we saw the impact of the gospel on every strata of society. So you had somebody like Lydia, who is uh, rich, who is influential, uh, who accepted the gospel. Uh, you also had somebody who is a slave girl. Uh, that person also accepted the gospel. Somebody who is, you could say, uh, in today's uh, Indian language, you know, middle class or average working class kind of a person who is a jailer who also responded to the gospel. So the ministry is impacting every strata of society and people are responding to this message that Paul is bringing to cities. Uh, what about the... Uh, the mindset of these people obviously the mindset will be very different now in the city of athens you had people who were mainly uh, philosophers okay so we could say something like intellectual people uh, and our question will always be how do you answer these intellectual people how do you answer people who are philosophical who uh, uh, subscribe to you know, a, a certain way of life. We'll see how Paul actually ministers to this category of you know, so-called intellectual, philosophical kind of people. So that is the type of people whom we are meeting in the city of Athens. And in today's uh, society, we might come across many such well-read individuals okay, who, will, who might uh, have their own uh, thought process about God. Uh, so what should we do? Should we sit and counter uh, what they believe or should we just simply present the gospel? How did Paul approach this group of people? That's what we are going to talk about. So let's see. So he's in Athens. He is uh, provoked. He's angry because uh, the city is given over to idols. Okay, uh, And sometimes this is how we respond. We, we go to a city and the spiritual condition of that city, you know, the Holy Spirit might move us and say, you have to minister in this community. You have to minister among these people. So you know, Paul is very, very passionately ministering over here. That what happens here? You know, there are two sets of people. You have some uh, 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 philosophical group known as the Epicurean people. And then you have the Stoic uh, philosophers. Now, both of these, uh, uh, like you know, both of these lines of thoughts were slightly different. So, the Epicureans believed in uh, pleasure. They believed in uh, you know living life to the fullest. They believed uh, in uh, uh, you know just just experiencing experiencing life very well. And that is the the meaning of life. You must uh, experience it. Right? the goodness that this life has to offer. But at the same time, you had stoic philosophers who believed in living uh, life right, doing the right thing, um, and uh, living life with dignity, things like that. So you had two lines of thought. And these people encounter Paul, and they belittle him. Okay, obviously, uh, he was a learned man, yes, but maybe not in the Greek philosophies. So they use a term like babbler. Oh, what is this man saying? Babbler is like baby, uh, baby language. Oh, this guy does not know anything. What is his level of knowledge? What is he actually saying? So they are uh, putting him down. Sometimes people might put us down for the lack of understanding of their culture or their traditions. It doesn't mean that we should not know about this. But even if we are looked down upon, uh, upon you know, we still have a message to share and we can share it in a good way. And we'll see Paul do that. So uh, they looked down on him. That was one way in which they evaluated him. Then they also said he's a proclaimer of foreign gods. So I told you, the society was very philosophical. And one of the things that interested them was uh, uh, some new uh, teaching, some new concept, okay, something new brought to the table. So even though they didn't find him, you know, such an intellectual, uh, they were interested in him because he was sharing about Jesus. He was sharing about, you know, uh, resurrection. So it was just intriguing for them. And they wanted to know what is it that this man has to tell us. 
So they took him and brought him to a place called Areopagus. Areopagus, or it was also known as Mars Hill. It was a place. Uh, uh, today, you know, we we uh, have some of these forums, uh, or you know, we we could look at uh, those days. They had theaters where they would have a man talk, and a lot of intellectual people will come and listen. So. Mars Hill was a place where the intellectuals will gather, okay, uh, and then you know somebody will come and present the new talk. Uh, so you, these days, you know, you have uh, forums like the TED Talks and all, where where something new is being shared by an individual. So something like that. All these intellectual philosophers they would gather at Areopagus uh, or Mars Hill, and they would let you know somebody speak. Of their uh, speak their uh, principles or their philosophy. So uh, Paul gets a chance to speak on Mars Hill or Areopagus. Uh, then they ask him, "Okay, we want to know what is your doctrine. Please tell us, uh, because you are bringing some strange teachings here, uh, and uh, we want to know what the meaning of these things." And these Athenians, uh, you know, they they loved philosophy. Just sit and listen and enjoy. Okay, so that was their intention. So they sat around. Now, Paul, he had observed the city uh, very well. So he talks to them and says, "Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. So you see the context to the Jews. How did he speak? He spoke directly, right, about the Messiah, and he reasoned with them." Okay? He reasoned with them in Thessalonica. He reasoned with them, but here in Athens, he realizes these people have no concept of the Lord Jesus. So how to talk to them? So he starts where they are, and he says, "I understand that you are very religious people, because he saw so many idols. He saw people are putting their faith in something. So they seem to be religious people. So that's what he says. Okay, I recognize you are religious people." Uh, and then he says, "Okay, you know what? When I was observing all your gods, I came across this altar which says to the unknown god. Okay, uh, this was this god whom you have been worshiping without knowing him. I proclaim to you. So Paul found a way. There was an unknown god they were worshiping. Okay, those days they had this uh, concept. The Greeks like they would." Uh, uh, usually worship a god whom they knew, but what if they missed a particular god? So they wanted to cover all gods. So they made altars to an unknown god. Even uh, when they worshipped, you know, apparently uh, they they would worship animals to all the known gods, uh, but in a region where there was no temple. So they wanted to sacrifice to someone. So then they would set up the altar of the unknown god and go ahead and worship. So he he picked up. He understood that culture. He understood that way of worship, and he picked up on this. And he said, "You are worshiping an unknown god. How about I tell you, you know, a little more about this unknown god?" So then he starts. You know, he he addresses based on their understanding. He says, "God who made the world and everything in it, since He is Lord of heaven and earth." Does not dwell in temples made with hands. So, see, he understands that these people are trying to make God because it was a city given to idols. So, he is bringing a new way of thinking. What is that thinking? God is the one who created the world. We can't create God. God created the world. Okay, and he saw there were many temples, idols. So he say, God cannot dwell. You can't contain him in temples. so he is giving them something which is opposing their belief but he is bringing it uh, in a in a very uh, honorable way you can say okay so he is not uh, accusing them rebuking them not like that but he is presenting his thoughts in a honorable way but these patterns are definitely different from what they believe then he says nor is he worship with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life breath and all things so he is exalting god above what understanding they have and he's saying look god is so great we cannot even comprehend him uh, and he is the source okay and we cannot try to create him so that's what he's trying to say then he says 
and he has made people right blood air from every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling so he's exalting this a creator god who is uh, who has control over everything and you know, he says that uh, uh, this god he has given us hope so he says so that they should seek the lord in the hope that they might grow for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us so he's saying look you are seekers okay and this god he wants us to find him okay let's move on he says for in him in him we live and move and we have our being as also some of your own poets have said now see he's trying to contextualize not that he is uh, unaware of their culture completely something something he throws in there to relate with them so he says look your own poets have said so bringing in something familiar he says for we are also his offspring so he quotes from the greek poets uh, and he kind kind of tries to win their hearts and then he moves on okay uh, and and he says that uh, uh, god is going to judge us one day and therefore you know, we have to repent and he brings in the gospel he brings in the gospel and he says that he will judge the world in righteousness by the man you see the message should always be about the person of jesus the message should always be about the 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 god whom we serve and not just about philosophies and this and that so again the way peter preached the way paul has been preaching in every city he comes back to the lord jesus so he says look there's going to be somebody who will judge us and this is the man whom he has ordained who is this man obviously it is the lord jesus and then he goes on to add he has given us assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead so he's talking about jesus he's talking about jesus dying about jesus being raised from the dead so the gospel this is what we call the gospel that jesus is the messiah that he paid the price right he died and he rose from the dead so paul is preaching the gospel but we see he's done it in a very very beautiful way where he has acknowledged that these are religious people he has uh, uh, shared his thoughts okay, and said that you know god we cannot create god the way you all are trying to create and worship no 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 god is the one who has created us but he wants us to seek him now let me show you who this god is uh, the unknown god whom you worship and he introduces the lord jesus here but the moment they uh, paul says resurrection of the dead you know the athenians did not like it i told us that they were philosophers and a lot of them wanted to believe that you know life has uh, life doesn't end because if you're saying resurrection then you have to talk about you know death and only one lifetime uh, sorry one, only one uh, uh, you know you you rise from the dead uh, and of course you know that for every man only one death is uh, one final death happens and then there is judgment because paul talked about judgment in his uh, in his uh, sermon here that they did not like one life what you do in that life becomes you have to be accountable then because there's going to be judgment right? resurrection judgment they didn't like these things they just wanted to believe that a person can live do whatever they want to do die and again be born right it sounds very familiar as uh, people in this nation you know we are familiar with these kinds of concepts and philosophies but even the greeks had similar uh, beliefs they just wanted to believe that you know again you will be born you can experience some other uh, some other things and accountability consequences these these things uh, made them uncomfortable so the moment he started talking about judgment resurrection from the dead they started mocking him uh, or again you know putting him down and they said okay stop stop enough today's session is over uh, how about we we hear about uh, uh, we will hear you again about this whole resurrection thing about this jesus later whatever you are saying till now it was nice good sermon good speech please stop time up okay so they uh, stop him there so paul he leaves 
he departs. He understands, okay, people, their hearts are not, you know, the variants, how they were receptive, their hearts were open. The hearts of these people were not open. So he stops and he departs from there, we are told, or he moves on from there because he has already preached. But you know, once he had preached, you have some people from Mars Hill or Areopagus. You might qualify them as intellectual people. They come week after week, listen to all these uh, speeches and go back. Some of those people believed. So those who had open hearts, they believed. We are told that Dio, uh, Dionysius, the Areopagite, okay, and a woman named Damaris and others with them, they believed. So did some intellectuals believe? Of course. Why? Because, you know, the message is a spiritual message. It's not that the message is opposed to uh, uh, an intellectual. Not at all. So, can we share the gospel to an intellectual person, a philosopher and all? Of course we can. How do we tailor make the message for them? We don't have to tailor make anything. You share the gospel as it is, but of course, without giving any offense. And if you want to contextualize it to them, then you know a little bit about what they believe. And then you can share it, uh, you know, in a, in a nice way with them. Will it resonate with somebody who is an intellectual or a philosopher? It will, because every human being is a spiritual being. So we don't have to sit and argue you know, concept after concept. Oh, this is what you believe. Okay, let me tell you, Bible uh, chapter verse, it says, don't do like this. Okay, now tell me what next. We, we don't have to sit and argue every philosophy, every thought. No, how did Paul minister? He contextualized, but he was focused on the gospel. He didn't argue with anybody. And the moment he shared the gospel, they were not willing uh, he understood, okay, some of them, their hearts are closed, so he is departing. And some of them whose hearts are open, they receive. So, you see, every city is different. Every set of people is different, okay? And every approach is different. But the, the, the core of it is we care for the people, we love the people, we want them to know Jesus. So, you bring the message in that way. And when you have done your part, you know, uh, uh, Paul had done his part. He had given his servant on Areopagus. Now he moves on to the next place. So city after city, city to city, right? He's moving on. Now let's see, which is the next place where he goes. So from Acts 17, we are going to Acts 18. Okay. So if you all have anything to ask, you just stop me. No problem. You know, I'll, I'll ask. I'll answer your question. I'm continuing because uh, I don't want to waste your time. You know, by giving long pauses. Uh, but definitely, I would like to share my thoughts. Uh, if you have any questions, so please, you know, just pitch in, unmute yourself, and ask. Are you okay so far? Is it too fast? Too much information? Okay, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. As of, okay, great, great. Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's go to the next uh, uh, city. Where does Paul go? Now, you remember Silas, Timothy, he was waiting for them, but uh, uh, it looks like you know they, they haven't joined the scene yet. Okay, so he is moving on. He finished his job at Athens. Next stop. Next stop is Corinth. I showed you, you know, the region of Achaia. Remember? Achaia, Corinth. So he comes after Athens, he goes to Corinth. Who does he find here? You see, Paul is not ministering alone. There are brethren, there are other believers, right? there are people who are also serving God. So here in, uh, here in Corinth, he comes across a wonderful couple. He found, they are Jews. He found a certain Jew by the name of Aquila. Okay, And he found, you know, this couple, Aquila was married to a lady, Priscilla. And we understand that Priscilla was from an influential family. Uh, uh, okay. And uh, so that's something that we learn about them. Now, this couple, we'll see that they will continue on with uh, Paul for some time. Um, and they, 
you know, they have an influence over the church of Corinth. So he meets this couple and uh, we are not, you know, very sure whether they were already believers or you know, Paul led them to uh, Christ, but they became Paul's good teammates. So that much we know. So he meets these Jews. They had actually come from Rome. So at that point, you know, there was uh, 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 some command. It was given by Claudius. He had asked the Jews to leave Rome. Okay, and which is why they left Italy and now they are uh, spending time in Corinth. Uh, and that's where Paul meets Aquila and Priscilla. How did they connect? We are told that they have the same trade. What was Paul's trade? Paul was a tent maker. And so were uh, Aquila and Priscilla. So they worked together uh, and uh, you know they they kind of served also together. Now, in Corinth, in Athens, what did he do? He went to the prominent place, which is Mars Hill, Areopagus, and there he shared the message. But in Corinth, there were a lot of Jews. So where does he go? His common uh, way of ministering is he goes to the place where he can share. That is the synagogue. So he goes to the synagogue every Sabbath, we are told, okay, in Corinth. And he makes his effort there. He's persuading both the Jews and the Greeks, or he's trying to convince. So it looks like you know he had to pull out scriptures from the Old Testament, and he had to confirm and say, This is the Messiah, he has fulfilled these, these promises, so on and so forth. So he's trying to convince or persuade both the Jews and the Greeks in the synagogues. And while he is in Corinth, he has people joining him. This is his team. Uh, remember Silas and uh, Timothy, they were left behind in Beria. So now they are joining. They come from uh, uh, Macedonia and they join Paul. And Paul was continually, you know, he was compelled by the Spirit and he was testifying to the Jews that, the, that Jesus is the Christ. So the gospel is being preached to the people in Corinth. Okay. Did all of them respond to Paul? That's the question. Everywhere he goes, he's preaching. But what is the response? We've seen the response in different cities. You know, uh, in Thessalonica, literally, they wanted to throw him out. So they even attack the person who is giving him place, Jason. What is going to happen in Corinth? He finds opposition in Corinth. Okay, so we are told that these Jews, they opposed him and they blasphemed. Meaning they would have said things up against him and uh, also, you know, uh, against God. So he shook his garments and he said to them, so he got very upset with these Corinthian Jews. Uh, and, you know, he, he said uh, something like, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean for now on, I will go to the Gentiles. You see that? You know, Paul generally does that in the cities. If the Jews are not going to listen, and in this case, we find that they were blaspheming, or they would have said things against God. So he's very upset, and he says, okay, fine, you don't want to listen, I will go to the Jews. Now, another thing that we must understand about Corinth, you know, uh, a little bit more background. We saw Athens is a philosophical uh, city, you know, very interested in learning, learning new things. That is Athens for you. Corinth in those times was a, uh, a prominent city, uh, but it was also a sinful city. It was known for its sin. You know? uh, whenever they use the term uh, Corinthian, a Corinthian had a bad connotation. Uh, attached to it. So there was a lot of sexual immorality in the city. Okay? Uh, and this could also be because of the god. Uh, I, I think the god they worshipped was Aphrodite. Uh, so they worshipped this god and there were temple prostitutes and there was a lot of sexual immorality in the city. So it was it was a hard city for Paul uh, to minister in. Uh, and that also we have to understand. It's a prominent city. <coughs> 
the identity of the city is it's a simple city also okay so just have all this background in mind and over here he's meeting some good uh, uh, fellow workers in Aquila, Priscilla, thankfully the team is larger and Silas and Timothy also come in, join them over here. Then he faces opposition uh, and so he decides, okay, fine, if these Jews are not going to listen, I'm just going to go and minister to the Gentiles. So he departs okay? and he enters the house of a man named Justice, one who worshipped uh, God whose house was next door to the synagogue. So likely that this is a uh, Gentile. Okay? And at that time, the ruler of the synagogue was a man called Crispus. Okay? And he and his household believed in God. So you see here that the leader of the Jews, so ruler of the synagogue, a Jewish man, Crispus, quietly is believing in uh, what Paul is preaching. But what about the other Jews in the synagogue? Obviously, they did not believe. They were opposing. So it's it's quite uh, upsetting for Paul. <coughs> Excuse me. But he's also ministering to justice, who is a Gentile person who is outside. So God is blessing his ministry. Even that much we can say that God is definitely blessing his ministry. I'm just Yeah, thank you. So, uh, Gentiles are believing, Jews are believing. Okay, so that is a good sign. It's a really good sign. But at the same time, there is opposition. So, a man like Paul, what can we expect? You know, do we expect him to um, become discouraged? Both the things are happening. People are believing. There's a lot of opposition also. Definitely, Paul was discouraged. Okay, he was discouraged in Corinth. Uh, and also, we don't know, maybe he found it uh, hard ground. You know, sometimes you, you look at certain places and you think, how in the world are these people going to believe God? So he seems to have been in a very discouraged situation. Okay? Can this happen to missionaries today? Can this happen to pastors today? Why not? Uh, the ministry looks hard. These people are uh, not responding. And on the other hand, some of them are opposing how to take this now. So he was in a hard and a difficult situation in the city of Corinth. So you look at the goodness of God. In verse 9, we see here, the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. God is encouraging Paul when he is facing opposition. And God, what is God saying? God is saying, do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. For I am with you. And no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. So the encouragement came from God. And God told him that uh, there are people in the city who will support you. Uh, and at the same time, you know, I want you to have the assurance that it may seem like you are the only one who is serving and doing the ministry. But you know what, Paul? I am with you. Do you remember this? I am with you. We find it uh, even in the Old Testament. You know, God used to send somebody. You know, I can think of Joshua. Where God said, be strong, be very courageous. I am with you. So it is God's way of encouraging his, his soldier, his minister. So God encourages Paul in the midst of very, very difficult ministry here. And we notice that he continued therefore. A year and six months. So how long? How long did he teach in Corinth? One and a half years. One and a half years. Was it easy for Paul? Obviously no. It was difficult to the extent <coughs> sorry, that God had to speak a word of encouragement for strengthening Paul's heart. So in this way, he continues 
to do the ministry. And while he was doing the ministry, you know what? The uh, Jews were still upset with him. And at one point, what did they do? They <laughs> rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. Okay, so far, has this happened? It has happened in a different way in every city. Over here, they bring him to the, uh, the in charge. Okay, at that point, there was a man called Gallio, who was the proconsul of, remember I told you, the region of Achaia. So Gallio is in charge. They bring Paul to him. And then, you know, they start accusing him at the judgment seat. They say, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. So what is the offense now? Uh, uh, what is Paul's offense? <clears throat> He's disregarding the law of the land. That is what we are saying. Okay. So, it, it, you know what? People just wanted to catch him. Was he really speaking something against the law of the land? We'll find out. So when this accusation comes, <clears throat> Paul was about to say something to defend himself because obviously he doesn't look like he had a lawyer of his own over here. So he's just about to say something. But Gallio, okay, replies to the Jews based on this accusation. He says, listen, all of you, you people who have brought Paul to me, if you had brought him for a matter of wrongdoing, let's say, He's a thief. He stole something. Or, you know, he did this crime. He beat up someone. He did something violent. Or some wicked crime. You know, for that reason, if you were to bring this man to me, then, yes, you know, I can, I can deal with the situation. But if this is a question of words and names and your own law, so Galio understood these Jews have something against Paul because of his faith and his belief, which was, you know, uh, the Jews felt that what Paul was preaching was contrary to uh, <clears throat> what they were proclaiming. So Gallio says, look, if it is about religion, if it is about faith and belief, because I don't see any crime. This man has not done any crime. It's not about any wrongdoing. It's about faith and words and names and all of these things. Your own law or your beliefs. Basically, he says, I don't want to judge such matters. Like, don't waste my time. This is not a, uh, <clears throat> this is a court for judging wrongdoing. Not faith and belief. Okay. So, he drives them out of the judgment seat. And they are so upset. The, uh, the people are so upset when this happens, when Gallio is not listening to them, that they beat up uh, a, a man called Sosthenes, okay, who is the ruler of the synagogue, uh, <clears throat> just to create some commotion. Okay? So that Gallio will understand that they are so upset and that he will say, okay, okay, no, come back, come back, everyone. Let's talk about Paul and you know, let's uh, judge him. They just try to create a scene. But God gives an escape for Paul through the answer of Gallio. You know, sometimes God can work even through the words of the leaders. It's amazing. Paul would have never expected. Maybe Paul was thinking, okay, what shall I say? How shall I escape? But what did God do for Paul? It's a it's a supernatural escape. Did we see? Uh, it's not like an angel came and uh, uh, <clears throat> took him out of the city or anything like that. But God put it in Gallio's heart to not take up this case. Okay, And so Paul escaped. And that's how our God works. You remember even Gamaliel and Peter uh, <clears throat> was under trial. He said, look, if it is God, you can't stop. And Gamaliel was an influential voice at that time. And because Gamaliel said that, the others listened to him and said, okay, leave it. If it is God, we can't stop it. right? But if it is man, it will come to an end. But I told you today, <clears throat> eight, uh, about nine years of the early church, they could not stop 
And what's happening now? It's continuing. The work is continuing. So it is God and his work is continuing. So sometimes God <coughs> can even work in the hearts of the leaders. And uh, an escape came for Paul in Corinth through Gallio's answer. So now, Paul, he stayed in Corinth for some time, did good work. Who else is with him? You have Aquila, Priscilla, you have uh, uh, <coughs> Silas, Timothy, right? So all are doing good ministry. They are, we just saw that Gentiles believing. We saw uh, the ruler of the synagogue believing. Who else believed? We don't have the names here, but obviously, if they are staying for one and a half years and doing ministry, there must be a good uh, church over there. Oh, uh, remember, he later writes to the Corinthians. So there is a church, the Corinthian church, and uh, it's, uh, it's a thriving church. So they are doing ministry there. So after he stayed for a good while, you know, he leaves that place, we are told, and he sails, uh, sails to Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. They also went along with him. Uh, he had his hair cut off and Sekria for he had taken a vow. So you find that Paul takes on a vow. Why, why is he taking on a vow? So one of the reasons why he was taking on a vow is those, as part of the Jewish traditions, they used to take a vow. <clears throat> and you know, uh, it is likely that he wanted to prove to the Jews that he was not disregarding the Jewish traditions. Now, by following this vow and all that, did it make Paul a better Christian? Not necessarily, because we know, of course, you know, when we say that, okay, God, I'm going to do this, we have to keep our word. The Bible encourages us to do that. But we don't have any rule which says you have to take vows, you have to follow these traditions. There is no such thing in scripture or for the Christian in the new, new covenant. So, uh, why is Paul doing it? The main reason could be that he wants to show that he is not disregarding the Jews or the Jewish traditions. He's as much a Jew as anyone else. So, he is basically uh, showing his honor for the Jewish culture. And he's saying that just because I believe, uh, uh, you know, in Jesus, the good parts of the Jewish traditions, it's not that I am dishonoring them, not at all. In fact, I'm keeping, I'm upholding them. So that could be one reason why Paul is uh, taking up this vow. Another thing, you know, some people speculate and say that living in Corinth was a very hard thing for Paul. It was a sinful city. Uh, it was a, uh, you know, a, a city with opposition and hatred against him. And with doing ministry, there was tough. You know, and also maybe the Corinthians, just discipling them would have been a tough task for Paul. So it was a symbol of his consecration to God, right? Surrounded by sin in the city. But maybe he just wanted an act of consecration to strengthen his faith. So he takes on a vow. That could be another reason why he actually took that vow. So he goes to Sekriya and then he takes up a vow. In that vow, what they would do is they would generally go you know, to uh, Jerusalem. They would keep some, some uh, rules and then finally they would go to Jerusalem and end the vow there. So now you would find that Paul is making a journey to Jerusalem. Okay? Now because he has taken the vow. So in Sankriya, he cut off uh, his hair and then uh, he comes to Ephesus. Remember Act 16, he wanted to go to Ephesus, but Holy Spirit forbid him. So he went to Macedonia. It's all about the timing. Okay, Was God saying, no, you cannot go to Asia, you cannot go to Ephesus? Was God saying, no, I'm shutting the door on you? No. Basically, in the way that God was leading him, God was saying, this is not the right time. At the right time, you can go to Asia. So now is the right time. As part of the end of his second missionary journey, he touches Ephesus. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. 
he leaves his team there uh, uh, and he enters the synagogue and he reasons with the Jews. Okay. Is he ministering in Ephesus during the second missionary journey? Yes, but not for a long period of time. You find that people ask him and they say, Paul, please stay back. He says, no, no, I can't. You know? And uh, uh, he didn't stay back, but he took leave and he was hurrying up to go for the feast in Jerusalem. So he's rushing, he's rushing to Jerusalem to complete his vow. Uh, but he gives them a word and he says, don't worry, you know, people in Ephesus, I will come back. But notice how he says it. He says, God willing, okay, God willing, I will come back. And he sailed from Ephesus. Yeah, uh, so then he landed at Caesarea, uh, he greeted the church there and he goes to Antioch. Okay, finally, he goes to Antioch uh, and he spends some time in Antioch because remember, it's his base church. Okay? He spends time there and he went over the region of Galatia and uh, Phrygia in order strengthening all the disciples. So that seems to be the way he makes this journey. So let me quickly, you know, once again, just for the sake of our understanding, let's have a look at the second missionary journey map. It will be very clear in our minds. This is the second missionary journey. So we started in Antioch, went to all these places, did not do any ministry in you know Asia, but went off to Macedonia, some of the cities over here. <clears throat> You remember Beria, Thessal Philippi Beria, Thessalonica, come to the region of Achaia, go to Corinth, uh, go to Athens, sorry, and then Corinth, go cut off his hair in Sencria. Then he's rushing. He goes to Ephesus. He ministers a little bit, but you know, they say, Oh, please stay back, Paul. He says, No, 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 I need to go right now to keep the peace. So he's going, going off to Caesarea. Okay, Caesarea, Jerusalem, going back to Antioch. So completed this second missionary journey. Three years, about three years of time to complete this entire journey. And we have seen, right? We have seen different types of cities. We have seen different types of people turning to the gospel, uh, turning to Christ. We have seen uh, opposition. Okay, uh, We have seen open hearts. So wow, what an experience. We have seen addition of team members, okay? we've seen the church planting a strategy where you go find a place where you can share the, the message, the best place where you can share the message. So generally it is the synagogues, but in Athens it was Mars Hill okay, or Areopagus where he shares the word. Once people come to Christ, you know, teach them some more about the word of God. Too. So stay for some time. The place where he stayed the longest as of now is Corinth. One year, six months, he stays there. Then he uh, <clears throat> goes ahead right, and completes the second missionary journey. So that is what we have seen so far. I hope you know we have understood and remember these things uh, because we are going to look at new things as we go forward. Okay, come on, let's, let's see what happens next. So second missionary journey, we have understood beautifully. Now, excuse me. So Paul, okay, uh, uh, he has completed his missionary journey. However, you see these people who had joined him, uh, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, uh, they stayed back at Ephesus. So who did he leave behind in Ephesus to take care of the, uh, the believers there? Looks like Aquila and Priscilla. They end up meeting a man by the name of Apollos. Okay, Apollos. This man, something very special about him. The description about him itself is inspiring. We are told he, he was born in Alexandria. Eloquent man. You know, eloquent is when somebody can just speak and it, you know the language flows, there is clarity, uh, there is knowledge, there is understanding in what that person says. Eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures. So 
seems like a personality similar to Paul, well read, eloquent man, uh, somebody who's mighty in scriptures. He comes to Ephesus. This man, uh, he was preaching, he was ministering, uh, you know, as led by God. He was something beautiful about him is he's learned, but at the same time, he is fervent in spirit. He's also passionate. What a combination, isn't it? It's like you know the scriptures, you understand, you're well equipped in the things of God. That is one thing. Well equipped and lacking passion, you know, sometimes that, that's not a good combination. But imagine somebody who's well equipped and passionate. So Apollos is one such man. Okay, energetic, passionate, knows uh, God's word really well. So a similar personality like Paul and Aquila and Priscilla meet him and he taught the scriptures accurately is what we are told. So when he started preaching and sharing in the synagogues, Aquila and Priscilla, they hear him out. They hear his message, but they realize that you know, there are certain things that he does not know yet. Now, what are all those matters which uh, they needed to teach him that we don't know, but see what it says. It says, Akula and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So, mentoring, right? Mentoring, equipping. So, is it possible that there are fervent believers who don't understand God's word, you know, thoroughly? See, we are not saying that, you know, someone else knows God's word thoroughly. That's not the point. But, you know, there is revelation that Aquila and Priscilla had about Christ and maybe the baptism in the Holy Spirit and you know a couple of other things which they felt Apollos doesn't have. So when they heard the message they realized hey Apollos doesn't know about Holy Spirit baptism okay come on let's teach him. So you see how ministers are equipping other ministers what a beautiful thing instead of getting jealous what an introduction we saw about Apollos right eloquent man, teaching, taught accurately. Akula and Priscilla could have become jealous of Apollos, but that was not the case. Instead, what did they decide? They decided, this is a good person. How about we teach him the things that are lacking uh, in his understanding? So they take him aside, they teach him the way of God more accurately. Uh, and then you know, he, uh, this Apollos, he desires to cross Achaia uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, they kind of, and then he desired to cross to Achaia. So he wants to go to Achaia. Remember, Ephesus is in Asia. We've seen that in the map, but he wants to go where Corinth is. And obviously we know that he ministered there in the Corinthian church. So, uh, you know, uh, so when he wants to go, the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. So he goes to minister. But how do they send him? They send him with a good word, a letter. It says, okay, this, we know Apollos. He is a good minister. Welcome him. Be hospitable to him and receive from him. Okay? And uh, he goes to Achaia and he does a good ministry there. We are told he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. And it wasn't an easy job at all. Uh, but uh, Polos was the right man, okay, for that job. And he went to a place like Corinth. We already saw difficult place. Even Paul found it difficult. But he went there. When Paul was not there, God, you know how uh, Paul later, when he writes to the Corinthian church, he says, Apollos, uh, what? Uh, I planted Apollos water. So God allows us to step into one another's work. Uh, but it's all about the kingdom of God. Okay. So with that, let's close off. I think we have covered quite a bit uh, in today's sessions. We'll pray and we'll close and then we'll come back and pick up from Acts chapter 19. It's going to be even more interesting. Okay, so I just request one person to please pray, either Dave or Kiran, because uh, Aran already prayed. Okay, ma'am, I'll pray. Yeah, please. Thank you. Father, we thank you for 
today's class we thank you that uh, you've been with us even though we have some difficulties but we thank you that you've been gracious to us that we can learn uh, from this world through series we thank you we have see we've seen your work your uh, work through how uh, through uh, apostle paul and silas and how you've done your ministry in all those areas of jesus we thank you lord that uh, let all this act be um, the inspiration for each one of us also, so that we can learn even more from uh, from your word how to do your ministry and how to work accordingly lord jesus we thank you for this time we, can, we ask you in the mighty name of jesus amen Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dave. God bless you all and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Bye.